All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you here to the People's Forum. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, if this is the first time you are here, uh, we want to welcome you all. Uh, we are a venue for political education, culture, and media uh, rooted in the struggles of the working class. And we know that historically, uh, any struggle uh, that is rooted in the fight for the poor and the dispossessed, um, we will get surveilled by the state. Um, and so we want to have a very timely discussion around uh, state surveillance, state spying. We've, over the past decade, we've seen this in Ferguson, in Occupy Wall Street, in Standing Rock, even in the 50s and the 60s with COINTELPRO. And this month marks the 100th year anniversary of the Palmer Raids. And so we want to welcome uh, Chip Gibbons. Uh, he is the policy director at Defending Rights and Dissent. Uh, he authored the report, Still Spying on Dissent, The Enduring Problem of FBI First Amendment Abuse. There are copies over there. Um, we also want to invite uh, Alice. She is a reporter at The Intercept where she writes about justice, immigration, and civil rights. Uh, she has reported from Palestine, Haiti, El Salvador, Colombia, and across the US. And we also want to invite Alex. Uh, he's a professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College and a visiting professor at London South Bank University. Um, Alex is the author of City of Disorder, How the Quality of Life Campaign transformed New York politics and the end of policing. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming here tonight and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming everyone. Um, let me just give a brief description. Can you hear me fine or am I okay? Sounds good. So I recently wrote this report called Still Spying on Dissent, the Enduring Problem of FBI First Amendment Abuse. As you can tell by the words still and enduring, it's a long-term problem and it's one that is continuing on. Um, what the report does is it looks at incidents of FBI political surveillance in the last 10 years and why I think it's important to compile all of those incidents in one place is because when we do see reports about FBI surveillance in the media, oftentimes, if we see them at all, and there's lots of good publications like The Intercept that, that, that cover this, but you know, other media, not the best track record, um, they'll oftentimes treat them as isolated incidents. So there'll be a story about like, oh, these environmental protesters got put on this watch list, but it won't mention you know, just last week, uh, the Student for Justice Palestine protesters in Berkeley had the FBI come to their doors. And when you start to compile all of the incidents together, it becomes very quickly clear that these are not isolated incidents. These are part of a wider pattern of how the FBI uses its counterterrorism authority repeatedly to spy on civil society groups, especially anti-war, racial justice, economic groups, economic justice, and environmental justice. And what we do after that is we go back and look at the 110 year history of the FBI because as still spying and enduring problem would indicate, this is a long term problem. And you can't really understand the problem of the FBI spying in the last 10 years unless you understand that the FBI is set up as a political police force. Um, when we do hear talks about the FBI as a political surveillance entity. There's this sort of narratives we sometimes hear, which are like, oh, all of that was pre-church committee and was really bad. A lot of times there'll be this sort of, um, it was all just Hoover's personality. Or, or, and then after that you'll see, and then after 9-11, people were very concerned with terrorism and they got a little overzealous. But um, you probably can't see this very well. As this timeline of FBI abuse, would indicate there's no magical period where the FBI is not acting as a political police force. And, and the FBI being a political police force 
was structural even before J. Edgar Hoover. Um, the FBI is founded in 1908 as the Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt wants to start a investigatory body within the Department of Justice, so they ask Congress. Congress says no, so you do as one does, and you wait till Congress goes on recess, and you do it anyways. And, and this is really important to remember because to this day, the FBI has no congressional charter and the main rules limiting them are the attorney general guidelines. Guidelines that are created at the whim of the attorney general and can be changed by any attorney general. Um, during this time period, a lot of police forces are developing quote unquote red squads. I believe the first red squad comes in Chicago after the Haymarket massacre. Um, and when Hoover enters the FBI, he's originally at the um, Enemy Alien War Board, but he goes later into the Bureau of Investigation's Radical Division which is later called the General Intelligence Division, which brings me to another point, which is that when most people think of the FBI, they think of it as a law enforcement agency. It's officially both a law enforcement agency and an intelligence agency. Um, and, and Tim Weiner, who wrote a book called Legacy of Ashes, people might be familiar with about the CIA, also wrote a book about the FBI solely as an intelligence entity. And he starts off the book with like, you know, Usually think of law enforcement, but post 9-11, its mission has been predominantly intelligence, and that's been the case throughout its history. And Alex is going to explain later why this is not a, a good way to look at law enforcement, but the standard narrative is that law enforcement is about gathering evidence to prosecute people for crimes, whereas intelligence is open-ended and, and free-flowing. Um, so. The first attempt to limit the FBI's political surveillance is in 1924, and, and that's exactly what it was. It said you can't investigate things that aren't violations of the federal code. Um, so when Hoover first starts off, he briefly been at the Library of Congress, and he brings his knowledge of the card catalog to use to catalog radical people. So he's in the General Intelligence Division, and he starts putting together dossiers and files on people who are radicals. Um, he goes after Emma Goldman and has her deported, and then after that, he's involved in carrying out the Palmer Raids, which are these raids of immigrants who are suspected of holding radical beliefs under the Anarchist Exclusion Act. Um, if you were a radical, you were eligible for deportation. Um, so they go and they carry out these raids, and there's no official count that was kept, but it's estimated between 6,000 and 10,000 people were arrested. And, and think about how hard it is to, in 1919, using 1919 technology, have the surveillance capabilities to compile dossiers and round up 10,000 people. Many of these people are arrested without warrants. Uh, many of them are tortured. Some of them are disappeared for periods of time. And, and the Palmer Raids is considered a real shameful episode in US history to the point where if you're ever um, nominated to be FBI director and Congress asks you, oh, has the FBI ever done anything wrong? You say, yes, twice. The Palmer Raids and spy on Martin Luther King. You know, that's what you say if you ever get before Congress. Um, that's my helpful advice for the night uh, to help you with your FBI directorship nominee. Uh, um, but, but so after the Palmer raids, even Hoover disowns them, and the attorney general makes the FBI stop, um, you know, not investigating things that are a violation, not a violation of the federal code, though Hoover finds an obscure law that allows him to report stuff to the State Department, so he uses that to spy on the communist. But then in the 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issues a series of executive orders giving the FBI national security powers, first to go after Nazis, then to go after um, communists, and then just general, like, broad-based, you have intelligence powers to safeguard the nation from subversion. Later, presidents would issue other executive orders. Um, hilariously, Hoover would often mislead them about what powers he already had, so they would think they would just be, be doing what the last president did and, in fact, be giving him new powers. Um, there was a GAO report in the mid-'70s on, on you know, what is the authority for the FBI's domestic intelligence investigation. It's like, it's very unclear what the authority is. Um, 
But he starts off by bringing up what he's, what's called the custodial detention index, and that is a list of people to be kept to be detained in the event of an emergency. And uh, Vito Marcantonio, who is a left-wing member of Congress who somehow gets the nominations of the Democratic, Republican, and American Labor Party, oftentimes in the same election, calls this terror by index cards. Remember, Hoover's at the Library of Congress. He loves the card catalog. They're literally index cards. I've, I've, I've seen them. Um, and it's a list to detain people. And the attorney general finds out about this, and he says, what are you doing? You can't do this. And Hoover said, you had better get rid of this list. And Hoover says, OK, I will. And he takes all of the cards and then relabels them the security index. And later, when Congress passes the Non-Detention Act of 1970, he does the same sort of shenan or not, he's dead, but the FBI does the same sort of shenanigans. And so we have this security index, which is um, the main mechanism for FBI surveillance. In theory, it's a list of people to be detained without trial in the event of a national emergency. Um, at the height of the list in 1955, there's 26, 174 people on it. There's also a second list called the reserve index, which means you're not dangerous enough to be on the security index, but you are dangerous enough to be tracked by the FBI. Um, so, so there's that list. And between these two lists, by 1960, the FBI has opened 430,000 files of individuals. Um, in 1950, the FBI, or Hoover actually goes to Truman after the outbreak of the Korean War and asks him to put 12,000 people in military detention. And Hoover says, no, I'm, I'm not going to, not Truman says, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but the important thing to remember about this list, as historian uh, Ellen Schreckner, who's one of the foremost historians of McCarthyism, points out, what it really is, is it's a vehicle for mass political surveillance. Because once you're on this index, they have to update your, your index card every year, and they do all this incredible surveillance. And I was actually doing research into FBI surveillance of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and I came across a file for someone called Robert Wells. He's not a real person. He just wrote, an, he was a pseudonym used by another person who wrote an article in a Communist Party um, magazine. But they actually opened an investigation into this fictitious person to decide whether or not to put him on this index. And they determined it was a pseudonym. So the other big thing that people might know about is Cointelpro. As a show of hands, who's ever heard of Cointelpro? This is not a quiz. I'm just curious. So yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the big program we usually think about. And I, I actually think that people oftentimes misunderstand what COINTELPRO was. It's, it stands for counterintelligence program. But the church committee is very clear in their report, COINTELPRO is not a counterintelligence program. It's a domestic covert operation designed to defend the status quo. And why did COINTELPRO come into exist? It started in 1956 specifically because the FBI is concerned that they don't have any legal way to go against communists, that the Supreme Court isn't going to let them continue to use the Smith Act, and that they're going to strike down all of the process crimes. So if they can't get these people on criminal charges, then they have to neutralize and disrupt them. So this is literally a covert action aimed at First Amendment protected speech with the intent of disrupting it to defend the status quo. And it's a very heinous program. I mean, under it, the FBI stages a police raid of the Black Panthers in, in Chicago and kill Fred Hampton and, and Mark Clark. So it's important to realize that this is not just a surveillance program. People oftentimes treat COINTELPRO as, as synonymous with surveillance. It's, it's well beyond surveillance. And when you look at people who had FBI files in that period, you know most of the file will be like Section 100 domestic security investigation, and that will be the surveillance. And then they'll see two or three pages maybe labeled COINTELPRO, and that will be the, the, the black ops, the covert ops. Um, a group breaks into the FBI office called the Citizens Commission to Investigate the FBI. I, I like it quite a bit. And they discover COINTELPRO, and as a result, there is uh, a movement to reform the FBI. You have the Church Committee in the Senate. Um, you have a GAO report. 
And as a result, the Attorney General agrees to put guidelines in largely to stop Congress from passing a charter. And as you can imagine, when Reagan comes into power or when George Bush comes into power, their Attorney Generals dramatically loosen the guidelines to the point that the current guidelines we have allow the FBI to investigate you if you're not suspected of criminal activity or threatening national security. Um, I lost track. Good. I'm good? Okay. Um, there we go. And then, so, so is the FBI fixed by this? No. Just a few years later, they're investigating the Committee in Solidarity with the people of El Salvador. They open up a really large number of investigations. They do 178 spin-off investigations. They gather information on 2,376 individuals, 1,330 groups. They take photos of protest. They dig through trash. They infiltrate meetings. They attend mass. And they collect license plate numbers. And, and I was going through the congressional hearings on this, and they have an FBI document in it that's a list of groups that are in support of CISPIS ideology. And some of the groups are obvious ones, like DSA or the Socialist Workers Party, but it's also like the National Teachers Union and the Mary Knoll Sisters. So you know, here you have the FBI keeping a list of like you know clergy that are in support of CISPIS ideology. And, and the thing to me about the CISPIS investigation, and this is a group that's opposed to Ronald Reagan's foreign policy, is that they open the investigation under looser classified foreign counterintelligence guidelines by trying to link the group to international terrorism, in this case, FMLN, who's now a legitimate party in El Salvador at the end of the Civil War. So, you know, the FBI is always like, we don't have enough power to do this, or we don't have enough power to do that. But here's a case where they literally concocted this ridiculous, non-existent connection to international terrorism to use a different set of classified guidelines so they could then open the investigation. I think the FBI is pretty good at finding authority to spy on people when they want to. They claim they're not. Um, and then in 1990, 1991, in the run-up to the first Gulf War, the FBI goes and visits Arab Americans at their homes and starts asking them political questions about the Gulf War and, of course, about Palestine, since it's always about Palestine. Um, and then, you know, after that, there's, there's all the um, hoopla around, you know, animal rights activists and environmentalists are terrorists. Then 9-11 happens, and we see the Patriot Act. We see uh, the FBI involved in rounding up 750 Muslims immediately after 9-11. Um, we also, in 2002, have the um, FBI Executive Assistant for Counterterrorism Counterintelligence Division telling Congress that one of the top terrorist threats in the nation are anarchist and extremist groups such as the Workers' World Party, Reclaim the Streets, and Carnival Against Capitalism. Like, when you think of top terror threats from 2002, like, shortly after 9-11, you're thinking carnival against capitalism, which, which shows, you know, what the FBI is doing. And then, you know, throughout the Bush years, there's, there's um, spy on Greenpeace, spy on anti-war activists, and as a result, Congress asked the inspector general to review this, and they do, and they release a report in 2010. Then just days after that report, they're raiding the homes of Palestinian solidarity activists in the Midwest. Um, and we know since 2010, they've spied on Occupy Wall Street. Before the first protester was in Zakati Park, the FBI was monitoring the movement. They completely conceded that Occupy Wall Street was a nonviolent movement, but there was the possibility a lone offender could exploit the movement for their own goals. And think about that logic. A lone offender could, could, could take over any group. They could take over a, a chess club or, or anything. But they use this as a pretext to single out certain groups. Why is that? I think you know the answer. But, you know, um, they, they spy heavily on Black Lives Matter. They issued the Black Identity uh, an Extremist Assessment, which um, Alicia is going to talk about. Um, they're at Standing Rock. They have an informant at Standing Rock. They're getting information from Tiger Swan. We know they've been visiting um, Palestine solidarity activists at their homes, asking questions. I, after a five-year or four-year legal battle with the FBI, am getting a, have been getting a very large cache of files about FBI surveillance of Palestine solidarity activists, which 
you will hear more about in the future, I hope. Um, we know that they've uh, visited proponents of Cuban normalization at their homes and asked them questions. We know that they're spying on anti-pipeline protesters. And this is just what we know through FOIA. And so what we see is, again and again, the FBI uses counterterrorism authorities to spy on nonviolent groups. And it's clear they're singling out certain groups. Um, you know, with like the BIE assessment, they make this really insidious argument, which is that, you know, because African Americans might be upset about racial injustice, shocking, um, they might engage in retaliatory lethal violence against the police. Or we see the border assessment that came out that said, you know, because people are upset about like migrant children in concentration camps, you know, there's a heightened chance of like violent conflict with anarchists and the federal government. So here you have people treating First Amendment protected speech uh, as a precursor to crime. And once again, they're only singling out certain types of speech. You don't see an FBI assessment that says, you know, because, you know, with criminal justice reform, you see a lot of whining from police unions and given sort of the fragility of the male ego that's at stake, perhaps, perhaps they might get, you know, violent. No, no, no. It's just people who don't think children should be in concentration camps or we shouldn't be bombing other countries or maybe we shouldn't send money for death squads in El Salvador. Um, so the FBI, from its inception, has been a political police force. It still is today. Um, that's the end of my part of this talk. So I'm just going to pick up the timeline at around 2014, August 2014, when Michael Brown is killed in Ferguson by Officer Darren Wilson. And, uh, and I think what the black identity extremism label that Chip just mentioned shows us is really how enduring the surveillance is. I mean, I think a lot of people that, that know about Cointelbro, and most of you do, <laughs> very show of hands, think of it as something of the past. Uh, a lot of people have this idea that this is something that was done, we hashed it over, we talked about it, it's done, it's, um, it's past history. And, and I think what the black identity extremism document shows is really it never ended and, and also the language is, is still there and, and the FBI is actually even retroactively applying some of today's analysis to what was happening back then. Uh, but just for those of you that are not really familiar with it, um, in the fall of 2017, um, Foreign Policy published a leaked threat assessment report by the FBI's uh, counterterrorism division that basically warned law enforcement that because of Ferguson, because people were upset um, at police violence, there might be a heightened threat against law enforcement across the country. And, and they took this report and distributed it to 20,000 law enforcement agencies across the country. Um, what's interesting, we got the report in about November 2017, but the report was actually circulated to police departments a week before the Unite the Right uh, rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. So you can kind of look at what the FBI's priorities were a week before one of the worst white supremacist violent incidents in, in, of recent years, and, uh, and what the FBI was worried about was Black Lives Matter activists. Um, and the report itself is really fascinating, and if you guys haven't read it, I really encourage everyone to read it. It's only 12 pages, it's easily, uh, it's easy to find online, and uh, it is written so poorly that the very definition of what a black identity extremist is doesn't have a verb. So you read this paragraph <laughs> with no predicate, and it's just it's really difficult to, I mean, you can't get a sense of what they, they may be getting at, but there is no actual <laughs> act that these people are supposedly accused of. Um, also, I mean, like, it's, kind of goes without saying it's obvious, but black identity extremism doesn't exist. It is a made up ideology the FBI literally invented. Um, and, uh, and they use that label to then go back and talk about you know, people that for decades have been angry about police uh, treatment of black Americans. So they retroactively label the Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, um, black identity extremists. They also go back to Ferguson, and, and Ferguson is really kind of a, a turning point, I think, for well, for, for many ways, of course, but it, it's also a turning point for, for the FBI. I mean, you had, as Chip talked about, you had, you know, Cointelpro, you had this kind of moment of public reckoning about it, and then fast forward, you had 9-11, all these new surveillance powers the FBI is handed with basically no scrutiny. Uh, you had some attention over the years brought to FBI surveillance of Muslims and Muslim Americans, um, and then Mike Brown gets killed, and all of those tools and all of those um, all of that funding and all of those, um, those forces that were, that were kind of like ramped up in, in the decade prior are now um, refocused on, on surveilling mostly black Americans and, and, 
and anyone really protesting at that point for black lives. Um, but to talk about the report a little bit, I actually went back to look at the story of, of how this report came to be. And a lot of uh, reports in the press will talk about Christopher Daniels, also known as Rakan Balogun, as the first known black identity extremism and uh, extremist, according to the FBI, of course. And um, Rakem is a, an activist from Dallas that was very involved with the uh, Huey P. Newton uh, gun club, so defending the, the Second Amendment rights of black Americans. And he was arrested on, a, on a, um, a weapons charge, held in jail for several months while the FBI tried to make this case that he was uh, this domestic terrorist. They failed miserably at that. He was ultimately um, acquitted of all charges. And, uh, and that's really the only case we knew about until uh, we started digging into it a little bit more. And as it turns out, actually, the, the first black identity extremists, or the first two guys the FBI retroactively described as black identity extremists, were two Ferguson protesters. Um, they were Olajuwon Davis and Brandon Baldwin. They were two young guys in their early 20s who, like many, many other people in Ferguson, had never really been involved with activist groups and had never really, really been out on the streets. And, and, and you know, I was in Ferguson three days after Mike Brown was killed, and you could really see early on in those days, this was an absolutely spontaneous movement. Before every, you know, every organization in the country came down, before there was a lot of kind of co-opting and a lot, a lot of organizing, but also a lot of folks that came to town that had, you know, various interests. The first days of the Ferguson protests were literally people reading that this had happened or seeing on their phones that this had happened and just walking out to Canfield Drive and protesting. And so, uh, Brandon Baldwin and, um, and Elijah Moon Davis were, were two of these guys. And, um, and in those very early days, they, they friended people, they friended members of the New Black Panther Party, which is not the Black Panther Party, uh, but um, they joined this organization. They were kind of looking to organize. And you, reading back the story, reading the court filings about this case, you can really see how the FBI in this case like, really exploited young, idealistic, uh, people that were for the first time kind of learning about all this. And uh, so they, they joined the MBPP, they uh, started organizing with them, and then shortly after they befriended two undercover, two, two FBI um, informants. And uh, fast forward three months later to November of 2014 when um, just a couple days before the grand jury announced that they were not going to press charges against Darren Wilson, these two guys are arrested. They're accused of plotting to bomb the St. Louis Ark um, plotting to kill prosecutor uh, Bob McCullough, who's the prosecutor in charge of the, of the case, and all kinds of, and, and, and accused of making all kinds of violent threats. Um, they had essentially been entrapped, although, and Chip can talk more about this, but the, the legal definition of entrapment is so problematic that nothing actually counts as entrapment, but for you know, uh, all purposes, they were entrapped. Um, they bought what they thought were pipe bombs from this um, FBI um, from these FBI agents that had really kind of pressured them, and uh, they ultimately ended up um, being convicted and are both serving prison time right now, seven years. They were threatened with 30 years at, at the beginning and um, ended up serving seven years. So three years later, the FBI takes this case that had happened, had been prosecuted, these guys were in prison, and calls them black identity extremism. In between that and the assessment report um, was 2016 uh, with the killings of Philando Castillo in Minnesota and Alton Sterling in Louisiana and kind of like a new round of protests. And you all might remember the, the killings of police officers, five police officers in Dallas and three police officers in Baton Rouge. So the FBI takes that and takes the Ferguson case and builds this report that really only lists six cases that appear to have nothing to do with each other other than the fact that the six guys they talk about are black, and at some point posted on Facebook about not liking cops very much, um, which I'm sure applies to a lot of other people. <laughs> and um, they, they build this assessment report that it's extremely problematic because it actually points to no organizing, no group, no, no networking, nothing. Um, just really this isolated incident uh, of violence. In three of the six cases they mention are cases of, of men that were actually killed on the scene, so there was never any actual um, prosecution afterwards to kind of hash out what had happened, what the ideologies were, if there was such a thing. And, um, and two of the other cases were, um, uh, were prosecuted at the state level, uh, one in Indiana, one in Arizona. But essentially, there was no connection, there was no movement. And, and the FBI's assessment report, if you read the language, is really arguing that there's this movement of, uh, of people that are threatening law enforcement. And, and the thing that, that just gets me every time is like over and over in these 12 pages, they say that this movement is based on the perception of racism and the yes. perception of injustice. <laughs> and, and, the, the, and, and that's what, what's so fascinating to me is just this idea that 
okay, well, you know, police violence is perceived, but black identity extremism is a real ideology. I mean, the contrast is just really outstanding. So when the report was made public um, by journalists, there was a huge uh, public outcry. There were a number of congressional hearings about it. Um, all kinds of people criticized the FBI for, for the report. The FBI never actually retracted it. They kind of defended themselves. They gave very contradictory statements about the, about the report. Uh, Director Ray testified in Congress that he knew about 50% about more cases of white supremacists than he did of, of black identity extremists. And then a few months later, he testified again that he actually didn't know of any black identity extremist investigations and cases because there weren't any. And, um, and, but still, like, you know, they persisted with this for well over a year, uh, saying that you know, we're not just going to concede to a public outcry. Uh, we have our own intelligence ways. And like, they never quite described how this report came to be. Um, instead, after all of this pushback and after a string of white supremacists, violent incidents that have happened in the couple years since then, they kind of backtracked this past year and they basically testified that actually, you know what, we're not going to talk about black identity extremists anymore. We are going to talk about racially motivated extremism, which is very colorblind um, and puts together supposed black identity extremists and, and white supremacist extremists. And th there's no way for the public to actually know what resources are being devoted to what what the FBI is actually spending its time investigating. So one more thing I'll say about that is um, in, the, in the aftermath of the BIE revelation, a number of groups filed public records requests. And as a lot of the, the stuff we know that, that Chip talks about in the report yeah. is based on FOIA, and we know so little about what's out there. I mean, we, we have a lot of examples, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's actually out there. But there were groups that filed a number of FOIAs that I'll just mention to um, the Center for Constitutional Rights and Color of Change discovered in some of the FOIA material they got that there was a draft race paper that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies were circulating. We know absolutely nothing of its content. After litigation, the FBI said that they never adopted it. It was just a draft. But the fact that the FBI in 2017, when they were doing it, was out there writing a race paper is, to me, just outstanding. If somebody gets their hands on that draft, I would absolutely love to see it. Um, the second lawsuit that was filed was by Media Justice, which is, has been very active, actually, at, at rallying well, first of all, pushing legislators to push the FBI for some clarity about this black identity extremism label. Uh, they filed a lawsuit with the ACLU, and they got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of redacted documents, which doesn't say a lot, except that the FBI is spending enough time, enough resources to produce hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages on this supposed black identity extremism um, threat. And one of the things that are not redacted that we can see is the fact that they're constantly reauthorizing assessments. So Chip talked about this a little bit, but you know, the FBI has different ways they investigate. Uh, there are predicated investigations based on actual, suppose that actual threats of violence or... Um, factual predicate. Uh, it literally, predicated investigation means we have a factual predicate. So the other investigation means no factual predicate. Right. And, and what we see in this black identity extremism case is that they have all these assessments based on no facts that they're constantly reauthorizing. We have no idea what's in them. And we have like little words here and there that were not redacted. So we know they surveilled the... Um, the um, the DC march organized in I think it was 2014 the Million Man March. Uh, they organized basically a number of of protests and and um, First Amendment protected activities. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with this. After a lot of pushback, they you know this this year they announced that they're now dropping this black identity extremism thing and calling it all racially motivated, which by the way is. A, a label and a framework that's being replicated at the local level as well. And you might have seen recently the NYPD announced that they are now starting a unit for racially and ethnically motivated extremism. Whatever that means, knowing the NYPD, it's not going to go well. Um, but so like the FBI is really kind of setting the tone and setting the, the discourse here. And, and you know, this, this panel is focused on the FBI, but there's a lot to say about what law enforcement agencies do with this FBI threat assessment reports because you know, the FBI is not following up with them. They're just handing out this thing to 20,000 police departments, many of which we know have very problematic histories um, and relationships with their black constituents. And they're essentially saying, these guys are domestic terrorists. So next time you see a protester, you know, act accordingly. That's kind of the message that's out there. And, uh, and I mean, I cannot stress enough how if, if you're a black person in a community that's already over police, that's already at heightened risk of violence, being called a terrorist doesn't help. And so that's really what, what they're doing. And even when the FBI ultimately does kind of walk back on this on this phrasing we have no idea what police departments are doing with it right um, and I'll mention this very briefly because it's not specifically about the FBI but I actually am working on a story that we'll publish next week so <laughs> go read it if you can um, that's looking at the Memphis Police Department that um, on their own without FBI kind of directive 
surveilled Black Lives Matter activists and protesters against police violence for years, even though they were actually, um, even though they, they, there was actually a consent decree dating back to the civil rights era that prohibits Memphis police from doing political surveillance. And in some of the, the testimonies, so they were sued by the ACLU, they lost uh, all, hundreds of pages of documents were public as part of the lawsuit. And what some of the testimony from, from the police officers has been is like, well, you know, we have the FBI talking about this domestic terror threats. We have these cops getting killed in Dallas. So what are we supposed to do? And so they, they started all these you know, very problematic surveillance programs locally that we can talk about more. Um, the other thing I want to say, and I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but um, the other thing I'll say, and you mentioned Stand and Rock. Um, yeah. Stand and Rock is really interesting because the FBI was there, absolutely. And they were, in fact, involved in one of the most controversial cases out of the person. So hundreds of people were arrested at Standing Rock. Most of them faced charges at the state level. A few of them faced federal charges. And to date, the person that got the longest prison sentence is Red Von Fallis, who was an activist that was accused of firing a gun during a protest um, and convicted and sentenced to, I believe, five years. Um, and it turned out, and we reported, that the gun that she fired actually belonged to her boyfriend, whom she had met at the camp, and who was an FBI informant. And uh, who, you know, after she was arrested, remained in contact with her and you know, called her from jail, called her while she was in jail and without, without ever disclosing who it was. And uh, so like, that case remains, um, you know, there, there are questions about it and what happened exactly, but, but the FBI was there very much so. The FBI was also involved in the case of Sofia Wilansky, who you guys might remember was one of the protesters that was injured really badly. I think um, part of her arm was blown off during a protest, and the FBI informant had told law enforcement that activists and protesters at Standing Rock were building um, pipe bombs and building explosive materials. And so the narrative that that put out there was that this was actually a protester-made weapon that, that hurt her. Um, but the other thing I'll say about Standing Rock, and we did a long, I think, 15 to 20 part investigation about it, so I won't go into all the details, is that there was actually a private surveillance operation, very sprawling. Uh, and you mentioned Tigerson. Tigerson is a, is a private security company that was hired by the Dakota Access Pipeline um, the, by, and their transfer uh, partners, which was the company in charge of, the, of DAPL to basically provide security um, for the pipeline. In fact, what they did for months and months, even after the camps were shut down, was gather all this intelligence on protesters. They originally started in North Dakota. They then went out to a bunch of different states. They were very focused on DAPL at first and then ended up talking about anyone connected to any free Palestine thing, because it's always about Palestine or any, Palestine? <laughs> anything else. And, uh, and they built this, and, and a lot of these guys came from a military background, because Tigers want to be working, working in Afghanistan and Iraq primarily. And they, they wrote all these assessment reports that they then fed to local police and the FBI. And you know the, the FBI might say, we didn't commission these, we just received them. But, but you can very much see how these uh, public-private partnerships are there and are absolutely exploited by the FBI. Uh, there are other examples of that not just with the FBI, that there's the case, uh, I think it was reported this summer, DHS using one of these private security companies to, to, pro, uh, to surveil protests um, against family separation at the border. So, so there's that element that I think we can talk more about. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think there's so much to say. I don't, I don't wanna kind of go into more of this yet, but, um, but when we talk about FBI political policing, it's, it's policing, right? And I think all policing, is political in a way, and Alex has written a whole book about that, so I will let him <laughs> tell you all about it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Alice, and thanks to Chip for writing such a fantastic report and keeping our attention focused on this crucial issue, because we're in a political moment here, right? Things are happening. And it's easy often to forget about political policing when our movements are more quiet and dormant. It's not that there's no political policing, it just takes a more subtle form, it's more in the background. But as our movements advance, we can expect increases in political policing, which Chip and Alice both have done such an important job in documenting. I'll just start with a little story. I, I grew up in a household with uh, a lot of skepticism about the FBI and political policing. My father grew up in a small coal mining town with a lot of left labor activism. And he decided to do his uh, senior project one year on uh, the Lincoln Brigade. 
Americans who fought in the Spanish Civil War. This is in the 1950s that he did this. And he managed to track down some people who lived in, uh, he was in uh, southern Illinois, in the coal belt of southern Illinois, and he tracked some guys down, and he went and tried to visit them, to interview them. And within about a week, the FBI showed up at his front door, right? This is over a decade after the Lincoln Brigade had, had existed, wanting to know why he was talking to these people, indicating that this surveillance was, was ongoing and would be quickly mobilized uh, to, to draw linkages to other people. So I want to talk about a couple of mistakes that we want to be careful to avoid when we think about this. First are a set of kind of liberal mistakes that people tend to make. One, as Alice ended with, is this idea that uh, political policing is somehow this separate thing that the police do. And that if we could just get a handle on that and make it more lawful, that this or, or try to reduce the politicalness of it and make it about the rule of law, that this would be a positive development. But this, of course, is a profound misunderstanding about the nature of policing as an institution. Policing is a political project. Not in the sense of, you know, electoral politics or partisan politics. Policing exists to facilitate regimes of exploitation. And as those regimes of exploitation shift, the nature of policing shifts to reflect that. So when we look at the origin of modern policing about 200 years ago, we see it linked always in its creation to three fundamental dynamics. And these are the rise of a mass industrial working class, slavery, and colonialism. Because these are the three most central regimes of exploitation that are important in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So, you know, the first state police force in the United States, the Pennsylvania State Police, was formed to suppress labor movements occurring in Pennsylvania in the coal fields and the steel mills, et cetera, that local police were unwilling or, in, or inadequately prepared to suppress. But where did the model for the Pennsylvania State Police come from? The U.S. occupation of the Philippines, where there was a direct transfer of personnel, techniques, et cetera, to be used to more effectively infiltrate, monitor, and suppress workers' movements. I argue that the first American police force, and really the first police force in the world that fits the typical liberal definition of a, a professional 24-hour uniform law enforcement oriented police department is the Charleston City Watch and Guard formed in, 17, in the 1790s that was designed to manage what was a mobile slave population. In the American southern cities, slaves actually worked outside the home of their owners in warehouses, wharves, factories, things like that, and they needed a way to manage this slave industrial population and so they formed the Charleston City Watch and Guard, not just to prevent slave uprisings, which was very much in their mind, but also to just manage the everyday lives of this mobile population to prevent them from learning to read, forming speakeasies, religious associations, all of which they, in fact, attempted to do. Uh, so the history of policing is a history of the, of the management of the consequences of regimes of exploitation. Because when people are being exploited, they're going to resist that. And so regimes look to mechanisms to managing that resistance. And policing solved a set of political problems for the state which had relied previously on the military, the militia, or informal mechanisms of social control that were either inadequate to the task or came with huge political costs in terms of a lack of legitimacy. So policing emerges as a modern solution to this problem of how the state can facilitate exploitation without the loss of legitimacy. 
And so policing is always couched in apolitical terms because that's essential to maintaining its legitimacy so that we learn to trust them, so that we cooperate with them, so that the language about policing and police reform is always about restoring the rule of law, making the police more professional, more embedded in the legal framework so that liberal democracy will be free to do its thing and who could be against that? So the whole premise here is that the rule of law, when properly implemented, is automatically liberating for everyone. But that's, of course, exactly the problem, is that these legal frameworks do not benefit everyone equally. Slavery was never against the law <laughs> when it was enacted, right? The, the slave patrols, uh, slave catchers in the North were all operating under the rule of law. So we have to be careful to not make the mistake of thinking that we can fix the problem of political policing by getting the police to better and more faithfully adhere to some notion of proper legal frameworks. We have to ask instead about the basic legitimacy of those legal frameworks and the basic legitimacy of an institution that is enabling regimes of exploitation. So our analysis of political policing must always include our analysis of what those regimes of exploitation are. So police today are not slave catchers and they're not enacting you know, colonialism. They're barely even managing you know, a, an industrial workforce anymore in the United States. We have this neoliberal austerity economy, and the consequences of those regimes of exploitation today take the form of mass homelessness, mass under and unemployment, and the production of black markets that go with that, of drugs and thievery and sex work, uh, the production of a massive population of people without access to adequate health care for things like substance abuse and mental health problems. So if we look at what police do every day today, it is the management of those social problems that are the direct result of the regimes of exploitation in place today. So getting the police to be more professional and law enforcement oriented as they carry out the war on drugs is not actually a progressive strategy. What does this look like in terms of political policing more concretely? Well, Alice uh, alluded to uh, the New York City mayor responding to a series of uh, uh, incidents that have been labeled as anti-Semitic by enhancing hate crimes enforcement and setting up special units to protect the Jewish community from people who might assault them. But Governor Cuomo's taken this even a step further. After the stabbing incident the other day, he announced that he wants to bring back a proposal to create a new domestic, state domestic terrorism law. This would be the first such law in the state. It also calls for an expansion of federal domestic terrorism uh, investigations and prosecutions. And so Cuomo is making the liberal mistake. He's saying that oh, we have a political problem in our society, and how do we fix that? By using the police to impose the rule of law in this seemingly neutral way that obviously is, you know, is couched in these terms of this is good for everybody. Because we, those right-wing extremists and anti-Semites and whatever are what are undermining liberal democracy. But of course, political policing has never operated within the law. Even at its most genuine you know, attempts or most ideologically framed attempts to operate in the law, it has never operated in the law. It is always extra legal. Agamben calls this the state of exception that's at the heart of the power of the state. Because what's in, what, the, what this makes clear is that the, what's most important is never the rule of law. The rule of law is just a tool to make these regimes of exploitation possible, and policing is just another one of these tools, 
and the law is merely a reference point. And this is not just true of political policing, this is true of all policing. Much of what the police do has nothing to do with what the law says. It's about managing disorder, it's about managing problems, it's about solving political problems. And so any strategy for fixing political po uh, policing that's about stabilizing the rule of law or getting them to conform more to the rule of law is doomed to fail. Uh, I'll also say that uh, as was pointed out that political policing is always done in conjunction with the private sector. It's always done in conjunction with the private sector. They're always sharing the databases. They're always working with right-wing extremist groups whether it's the Catholic League or the American Legion, they're creating blacklists that they then share with right-wing groups who go out and intimidate employers and landlords or, or break up meetings. So any time we see political policing going on, we should be asking ourselves, who are the partners that they're working with? Well, there are the obvious ones, like at Standing Rock, where there are the professional security agencies, the privatization of the security state that's going on, but there's also going to be I, usually even other layers of informal right-wing formations that information will be leaked to. I think some people probably saw the footage from Portland, Oregon, where um, the, some of the right-wing militias are helping the police make arrests of anti-fascist organizers, right? And the police, thank you very much, you know, there's a allegations that intelligence was shared with these groups by the, by the Portland police, et cetera. So this is not the exception, this is the norm for political policing. But sometimes we make, we run the risk of making mistakes within the movement as well. And that is, I think, in thinking that there's very little that can be done about policing until the revolution. <laughs> this was referred to as a, uh, as a form of left idealism uh, by um, some critical criminologists in the 1970s and 80s who said that there, there's, a, there's a tendency of people to say that policing is so central to the exploitative state that there's very little that can be done about it until we replace the state. And then we will dismantle these repressive institutions and create something else. Well, the results of that have not been very good in those cases where we have seen a change in state. I just got back from a week in Cuba and there are police and they serve a very similar function to police in the United States. You know, it's not as racialized, it's not as violent as a general rule, but there's still a number of problematic elements to it, and I don't think anyone wants to sit here and celebrate the Soviet police state just because they got rid of capitalism. Um, so what can we do to build the kind of power, but also a set of logics and principles that help us build our movements, help us get to where we're going, that create victories along the way that don't rely on us creating the full revolution first and then dismantling this apparatus. And this is something that I've struggled with tremendously. And in fact, the chapter on political policing in my book, I find very unsatisfactory in some ways. And I, um, uh, my friend Connor at the Center for Crime and Justice Studies in London wrote a nice critique of that chapter, actually, which you can find on the Verso webpage uh, blog that's attached to my uh, book page, I believe, that says that we, you know, we have to be very careful in imagining any legitimacy of political policing and that we not you know, fall into certain kinds of reformist traps here. And I struggled with trying to figure out what are the concrete struggles against political policing that we should engage in short of abolishing all police, which is the end goal, but we have to figure out how to get there. 
So let me give you a few things that are fairly concrete that we could be calling for that contain the logic of abolition uh, but don't require the full revolution or the end of all policing for us to make some concrete gains. So first is I do think transparency is important. And I give credit to the ACLU and other groups for continuing to pursue transparency, sometimes in the absence of any larger clear agenda, and sometimes they engage in consent decrees and other things that are reformist in ways that I think may not be helpful. But transparency is important in part because it undermines this liberal narrative that says that the police are not political. And if we are going to create a logic that all policing is political and therefore all policing is deeply problematic, we must expose its fundamental political nature. So the 30 pages of redacted text with two words showing, you know, we got to keep at it. It's frustrating. I've read through many such documents trying to read the tea leaves of what's in there. Uh, but we have to keep exposing as much as we can find out as reliably as we can. But we do know some stuff and we, there are some other concrete things we can do. I think we have to look closely at things like joint terrorism task forces and fusion centers. And I want to recommend Brendan McQuaid's book on fusion centers, which is uh, the first real book that got inside one of these fusion centers and has a very uh, strong left analysis of what's going on there. Fusion centers are a good target and JTTFs are a good target because they involve partnerships between local law enforcement and state and federal law enforcement and so it gives us a local target. So what some people have done in places like Portland is demand that their police no longer participate in these partnerships. Even in, I believe it was Atlanta or New Orleans where they, the, the, the feds were refusing to use body cameras but the local police were using body cameras and so they pulled out because, well, I don't, body cameras are not going to solve any of the problems we're really concerned about with, but we need to use whatever tools we can to delegitimate these partnerships and to try to pull. That in itself is not going to be the solution. It's not going to end political policing, but it is a way of establishing the logic that reform is about dismantling. It's about taking their toys away in every possible circumstance that we can think of. So I think that, um, that this is a, a central strategy that we need to undertake. The other is to push back against this kind of Cuomo bullshit. You know, Cuomo never saw a problem that he couldn't fix with more criminalization. Mass homelessness and a dysfunctioning in the subways, dysfunctioning, so, well, the solution to that is obviously a you know, quarter billion dollars of new policing infrastructure. So this guy is obviously not our friend on any important issue and has to be called out across the board on this. And those politicians here in New York City that continue to back him because they cut their little deals with him have to be held to account as well. And when Cuomo first brought this idea of a domestic terrorism law, the D Democratic legislators were falling all over themselves to write positive reviews of it. So Andrea Stewart Cousins and Carl Heasty both came out very positive for this because you know it has some language about you know hate crimes or something. And hate crimes legislation is, is just as bad as the anti-terrorism stuff. It's really in many ways indistinguishable because this is about creating an infrastructure of investigation and enforcement and prosecution that turns problems, political problems, into criminal justice problems. And let's just look for a second at this case in Monzi, New York, the, the horrible stabbing that happened there. Yet again, this is a person, the offender is a person with a long, well-documented history of severe mental health problems. This is not just somebody who's a little depressed. It's a person with documented schizophrenia. People in the community knew about his severe mental illness and had spent years trying to get him adequate treatment. Now, 
his delusions and schizophrenia involves delusions and the inability to distinguish reality from fantasy and to hear voices, etc. Right? Is there a reason why the ravings and the voices took on an anti-Semitic characteristic? Well, that may have something to do with the fact that we have a right-wing nutjob president who has anti-Semites running his administration. But that doesn't make him, the offender in this case, an anti-Semite. It makes him someone who's deeply confused and in need of supportive housing with ongoing supervised medical treatment. But Cuomo very astutely because he supports austerity and opposes any funding increases for mental health services, says, well, the way to avoid any personal responsibility, and I do hold him personally responsible, is to say that this is a hate crime problem or a domestic terrorism problem. So this is all about turning problems into criminal justice problems where the solution is a more coercive state that wants to just put more people in prison and, and create more fear in our communities. So I'll stop there and would have some discussion among us or just go straight to questions. What do you think? Thank you. I mean, just one thing I can add to, to this, um, the question of, and I've gotten into some of this and some of my colleagues have written about this much more than I have, but we actually published this project uh, last year on domestic terror, and, and as we've seen um, a number of violent white supremacist attacks over the last few years, there have been all these calls for more domestic terror laws, more domestic terror, which we have plenty of, actually. And I think there's a, a lot of misunderstanding uh, around what, what legislation is available, so we, we compiled actually this database that, that sort of looks at, you know, which you can say like, it's problematic to kind of take the definition as, as they are and take the laws as they are, but even with the laws as we have them, it's been so disparate the way these things have been applied and ways people are charged um, as w with domestic terrorism laws versus not, and ultimately it ends up being about the religion of the person who's being charged, right? So we have, um, we have a lot of kind of arbitrariness in the way that the laws that we do have are applied, but we have plenty of laws. So I think the idea of calling for more domestic terror laws, which we've seen a lot, in the last couple of years is you know, something to be alert about, uh, if not straight out opposed to. Um, and that also goes for the surveillance. Like something that you know, I've seen a lot of people talk about is like, well, why not surveil Nazis? Why not surveil white supremacists the way we surveil Black Lives Matter activists? And I absolutely understand where that sentiment comes from. And, um, and, and I think there's, you know, looking at the laws that we do have, there's a very real difference between kind of policing ideology period and policing criminal intent and criminal planning, right, which we know is happening. So to the extent that criminal planning is happening and crimes are happening, by all means, go ahead and investigate it. But I think there's been this tendency to kind of be like, well, why not the white supremacists? And, and I worry about that being kind of like the takeaway from all this, because inevitably, when more surveillance apparatuses are set up, when more technology is brought in, it is going to blow back on people of color, it is going to blow back on dissenters and government critics. Once the systems are there, they won't be used to go after white supremacists only, which is why I said earlier, I, this new NYPD unit makes me extremely nervous because um, it is so broad and colorblind that you know, you can take a guess who's going to be targeted. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> oh, is this, is this yeah, yeah, the sort of exploitation <coughs> of, of good faith concern about the rise of white supremacist violence by the FBI is, is one of the most cynical things I've, I've seen, and it's, it's very, very disturbing. I, I wrote an entire piece for In These Times about why a new terror law is, is not the answer to this. First of all, there are multiple laws on the books that apply to white supremacist violence. Um, second of all, like I pointed out, the FBI sitting there and saying, oh, we want to investigate this, but we don't have any tools to investigate it. You know, like I pointed out, like with CISPIS, they, they made up this nonsensical connection to a foreign terrorist group to get a different set of guidelines. In the 2010 OIG report, they talk about how the FBI investigated the Catholic worker movement for terrorism because somebody threw red paint at a recruitment station and then sent an email saying, this is for the people of Iraq who were tortured under Saddam Hussein and are now tortured under the US occupation. 
And the OIG concluded that under the FBI's definition of terrorism, that was a correct investigation because there was a use of force for political change, right? Like if you can find like pacifists throwing red paint as being terrorist because the definition of terrorism you use is so elastic, you're not, you don't have a shortage of, of tools to investigate white supremacist violence with. And then finally, there's just the white supremacist nature of the FBI. There was an incident where there was a protest by the Traditionalist Workers Party and a group called By Any Means Necessary counter-protested them, counter them, and they were stabbed by the Traditionalist Workers Party. And the FBI opened up a counterterrorism investigation into the protesters who were stabbed. Um, they also got the name of the fascist group that was protesting incorrect. They thought it was the Ku Klux Klan. And then in their report, they described the Ku Klux Klan as a group that some people believe hold white supremacist views. <laughs> so, like, here's an instance. Fascist violence. Attacking someone with a knife for political purposes. Who do they investigate? And if we give them more power, who do we think they're going to investigate? Let, let's just imagine for a minute, <laughs> requires deep imagining here, that the FBI does make a good faith effort to go after right-wing extremist groups. Let's just imagine that for a second. This assumes that the technology of surveillance infiltration and you know subversion is an effective way of managing a deep political problem in our society. We don't accept that logic when it's applied to our movements, and I don't think we should accept that logic when it's applied to right-wing nutjob movements. These are political problems, and again, this is about the state turning political problems into criminal justice problems to avoid them having to actually deal with the politics. So part of what we have to demand is a political solution to our political problems. And that means keeping this all entirely out of the hands of any part of the criminal justice system. One, one interesting factoid about the FBI is that they did open a COINTELPRO program into the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and the rationale for that, because COINTELPRO, like I mentioned before, is, is covert action against groups that you don't have a law enforcement solution for. And uh, the church committee was very clear in finding that the Ku Klux Klan COINTELPRO unlike the other ones, actually targeted people with a nexus to violence. It was more limited. Um, but that the rationale for it was that you couldn't prosecute the Ku Klux Klan because they were so embedded with local law enforcement. And the Ku Klux Klan informant who testified during the church committee, he was in the witness protection program, so he had to wear a disguise. He wore a white pillowcase with, with, with eyes cut out. I'm not making this up. Google it. Gary Rowe Church Committee. It is very um, disturbing for a number of reasons. It also clashed with his maroon colored suit very poorly. Um, and, and, and he talks about how he told the FBI that the Alabama police had told the Klan they had 15 minutes to beat up the Freedom Riders and then they would come in and tell him, you know, no more. And he tells the FBI this, and the FBI does nothing. Um, what he did do as part of his counterintelligence actions against the FBI, against the Ku Klux Klan, the FBI encouraged him to do, was to sleep with Klan wives, uh, wives of Ku Klux Klan members, to, so to settle dissension. Yes, which is, you know, real great solution to, to white supremacy. Um, and. His testimony is actually really disturbing for a number of reasons because he goes through the extent of collusion between the Klan and the, and the um, local police. He mentioned they had access to the um, police's intelligence files. He mentioned staking out and surveying churches in police cars. Um, he also murdered people. Um, like he was in the witness protection program because he was with multiple Klan members who pulled over two civil rights activists, got out of the car, and shot them. He claims he was just pretending to shoot them. Um, I would not encourage you to try that defense. You know, oh, my friends were shooting them, but I was just pretending to. Would not actually work for anyone else but an FBI informant. But then later in his life, he confessed to other murders as, as well. Um, so, you know, very disturbing person. I, I forget what my original point was. Um, 
Don't have people testify from the Ku Klux Klan before Congress with, with, with pillowcases over their head. It's not, not a good disguise. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Yeah, let's take some okay. questions. Okay. Right up front here. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you say, uh, you know, we should just look at this anti-Semitic person or their action as a mental Ill illness problem, that's exactly what the right, you know, the Republicans say whenever there's a, a you know, a, a white supremacist sniper attack or something. And so there is anti-Semitism and there is racism, and I think they need to be Yeah, so I don't want to, I didn't mean to imply, and I don't think I did, that there's not anti-Semitism. I mean, it's built into the structure of the current government, right? right? And so, yes, I did, and I, I do completely take him off the hook. It is completely unproductive to think of that incident as an act of anti-Semitism that can be dealt with in any meaningful way by the criminal justice system. Yeah, so, so it is important to evaluate each situation specifically, but whether or not a particular case is an example, the solution is never the criminal justice system in my view. This is, anti-Semitism is a deep political problem in American society and we need strategies to address that. But there is a tendency among people in the political class, right, to immediately frame this as a hate crime because that absolves them of any responsibility of dealing with the underlying political problems. And that's the point that, that I want to emphasize. Um, thanks. Um, so I, my question is for Alici, but I'll tell a story about Chip and I. <laughs> Which I think gives some context. So Chip and I, in DC, when I used to live in DC, were at the Venezuelan embassy defense. And we were with the Democratic Socialists and the Party of Socialist Liberation and Code Pink. And the police, you know, were supposed to moderate. Obviously, they didn't really moderate between us and the right-wing Venezuelans. They were clearly on the, even to my surprise, were so clearly on the right-wing Venezuelan side. But there was one comment that stuck with me that, and it was, um, I think Chip heard it or, too, was that this, the police officer goes, well, there's the, the Venezuelans over there, and there are the people who are paid by Russia over there. And his tone took, struck me as like he actually believed that. And I'm just wondering, and so it starts for Leachy because you made some comments like, I'm just curious about how much of this is actually what the police believe, and how does that affect their work? Because I was shocked myself, because I was just so used to that as being like an imaginary talking point that this law enforcement, because he wasn't saying it to provoke us, that was the thing. If he had said it, to, got it to my face and said like, you were, you're paid by Russia, you know, I would have said, oh, he's just fucking with me. But yeah. he, he, he had that tone where he was making casual conversation the way that we say the, poli clan, the clan and the police go hand in hand. Because like, we actually believe that even though people would say we're just trying to provoke them. Um, and we know that for a fact. And so, if I, so none of us are saying that in a secondary way. So I'm just wondering how, that, how much you think this is actually them believing their own hype and how does that actually, and, does, and, I, and I'm just curious, what do you think how that affects the results of their own investigations? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question. And there's obviously a whole lot of law enforcement in the country with like all kinds of ed, like personal backgrounds, educational backgrounds, like different things they've been exposed to. So like it's very difficult to generalize. But I think one thing that I saw in a story that I actually didn't mention earlier, but um, that I wrote earlier this year about still kind of like the Ferguson protests, the Baltimore protests, and what happened in the aftermath of this. And some of the documents that were, um, that were turned over as part of various foils showed all of this chatter between different law enforcement agencies around the protests and all of these news clips they're sharing. And these guys are sharing, well, Fox in the best of, you know, of circumstances, but then sharing, you know, Infowars on a regular basis, Breitbart on a regular basis. And, you know, like we, I don't know if you all have some, racist uncles on Facebook that share some just absolutely 
bullshit kind of like propaganda, then a lot of these guys are sharing that too. And there's no kind of, there's no sort of mediation. There's no, I mean, there's like barely any fact checking in news these days anyway, but there's, there's no one there that's actually looking at what are you sharing? What are you looking at? Where these ideas come from? And if the discourse that we are in right now is that, then I mean, police are not immune to that by any means, right? So there, there's no kind of like department training that, that will teach them that, I would hope. But, but those are the things that are hearing and those are the things that are sharing. And I think seeing those emails was actually very revelatory. And, and I'll give another example of, of some of the stuff they were sharing after Ferguson was, you know, the FBI, DHS sent around all these alerts about how supposedly like um, ISIS-linked accounts overseas were calling on black Americans to join their protests. And then local law enforcement departments took that and then started sharing all these stories, including stories saying that, you know, look, there's this guy with a kafia in Ferguson. Like, like taking things like this that they just saw on, on Fox in the best circumstances, right? And that's what was informing the, the discussions. Um, in the Memphis case, and I mentioned briefly the Memphis lawsuit, and I won't go into all the details, but there were intelligence reports that police prepared three times a day and shared with a bunch of different law enforcement agencies, businesses, to go back to the business question, like FedEx and other large businesses in Memphis. And they're pulling all this national news. So like, you know, the header is like five cops are killed in, in Dallas. And then there's all this propaganda news from just like really awful, terrible news sites. And then there's like a Facebook post about this peace vigil Memphis organizers are, are putting up. And all of it in one document. So you can kind of see like how the discourse sort of like tracks so that when they show up and police this protest, that's their thinking. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think there are a lot of right-wing ideologues in police and, and in intelligence. And, you know, Alex was mentioning private groups, and there's there's two categories. They're, they're not always distinct, but there's, like, the ideological groups, like the American Protectorate League or the American Legion, and then there's the for-profit groups as well, though a number of the for-profit groups are ideologically motivated as well. Money and ideology often go hand in hand. And I, I think, you know, if the police are riding around with the Klan, you know, surveilling people, it's it's indicative of what their worldview is. And when you look at these sorts of FBI, if you read a lot of FBI files like I do, I mean, you see again and again right-wing worldviews or investigations that when they are predicated, use right-wing propaganda as sources. I believe the investigation into the... Um, Ronald Reagan's foreign policy opponents was spurred in part by something from the John Birch Society. Um, I am looking at files right now involving Palestine solidarity activists, and a lot of the information in the letterhead memo asking for a six-month extension of this investigation cites to Front Page Magazine, the David Horowitz racist right-wing website, and when I, I went and read the front page article, I mean, it's totally false. And some of the information on it is contradicted by, like, the State Department's human rights report on, on Palestine. And it's like, oh, leftist propaganda like BBC and CNN says. And it's like, <laughs> but, but the real truth is this thing... I mean, it was over. It was over an ISM activist who was shot by the IDF, and the IDF soldier who did so was actually prosecuted by an Israeli military court. So imagine how bad things had to be. And this whole article is like, maybe we don't know the whole truth. What if he was in uniform? What if he was carrying a weapon? And it's like, what? You won't see that in the leftist BBC or the State Department website or the Israeli fact-finding mission or the British Corners Inquest or the court-martial of the guy. Um, but like, if you or I, David, or Alex, or Alicia read this, we'd think this is, this is nonsense. But people in the FBI look at this and think this is legitimate. Like, people look at like Infowars, which has like, you know, there's chemicals in juice boxes that are making frogs gay, and think, oh, this is a source of information I should rely on. And if you're a right-wing ideologue, you're going to be susceptible to that kinds of things. If you're a semi-aware person, you're going to stand back. You mentioned something about training. <clears throat> training them to be fascist, but the, but the liberal mistake is that we can train them not to be fascists. And this is just not true, right? So this is, includes things like implicit bias training, which assumes that the problems of race and policing are about unconscious, unintentional little prejudices 
And I, I always say, well, we got a problem of explicit racism in American policing, and it's built into the nature of the institution. I, I always say, if you, if you don't want violence and racism, don't get the police involved. <laughs> Figure out some other way to deal with whatever it is you need to have dealt with. And if you don't want right-wing craziness, don't get the FBI involved. Don't get police involved because you're not going to eliminate that bias, which is not to say that every police officer is a thin blue line right-wing ideologue, because that is definitely not true. I, you know, I work with police all around the country, around the world. A lot of them think they're reformers. They embrace all this training, right? They're, but it's all irrelevant, right? Because the mission is itself fundamentally about reproducing profound injustices. And so it will always lend itself to those ideological frameworks. Uh, let's get way, way in the back, how about? <coughs> There's a microphone coming to you, hold on a sec. Um, I wanna make some points about COINTELPRO with the thinking that we are now in the days of neo COINTELPRO and to understand what that means, it's a good thing to know what Colin Pro was. I'm gonna quote from Frank Church's uh, investigation. Respectful, be respectful of other people who are waiting to ask questions. Okay, this shouldn't take long. Uh, just a few quick quotes. Um, and by the way, this is on Wikipedia on, under the topic of Colin Pro. You can get the entire report, which I would urge people to read. But uh, the committee concluded that FBI infringed on constitutional rights of citizens. Legal questions were often, quote, not considered. On other occasions, they were intentionally disregarded. The committee found the most serious breaches were those of senior officials. The Bureau conducted a sophisticated vigilante operation aimed at squarely preventing the exercise of First Amendment rights. There's no point in mincing words, that's fascism. They were organizing violence against people's rights. They're legally mandated to defend them. Neo Colantel Pro now joins up with these joint terrorism task forces, diffusion centers, and now the covert operation extends to local police departments, to corporations, to squads of viol violent citizens, and it's like Colin on steroids. It's a danger to everyone in this room, and it really has to be exposed. Thank you. That's a, a good point, and I think that the report does a, a good job of that. That, that quote about Cointopro is actually in the section on Cointopro in the report, um, and I believe Alex was talking about JTTS, which is also in, in the report as well. So your point is well taken. This, this woman in the middle okay. here, maybe? Hi, um, just two really quick anecdotes and then a question. The two quick anecdotes refer to your, I was the one who said, can we not do the back and forth? <laughs> um, the two anecdotes are, I lived in Palestine on the, on the Israeli side, in Haifa, had a friend who was definitely not anti-Semitic, was Palestinian. All his friends were Jewish, he didn't have any Arab friends. He had a manic episode, he went on a, like, world, you know, Jews control the world rant and was arrested. You know, this happens. Another anecdote, a friend of mine who's white was, had a manic episode here in the U.S., was arrested and thought he was black, thought he was experiencing ra racism as a black person, even though he was white. So when, when people have these kinds of breakdowns, it's really, they, they're not exactly the person they were before, <laughs> you know? So that's one thing. Um, and, and mental health issues are, really do need to come into this conversation in a really big way. Um, and we just haven't been able to talk about these issues properly because of all of the loadedness of it. But okay, so here's my question. Um, I was involved in Palestine. I'm definitely on some lists because of that, which is very frustrating. I was involved in, in, during Occupy Wall Street. And after Occupy Wall Street, some of us got together and tried to address the people that we knew were informants. 
without creating a feeling of paranoia that already existed or kind of like facilitating more distrust. And all of the infiltration have been highly effective at breeding mistrust. No one trusted any, each other anymore. So we, we needed to build trust while also calling out these individuals. And I, I did a lot of research. I probably didn't look in the right places, but I never found anything, any advice from prior movements aside from some work by the Black Panthers about how to deal with informants effectively and maintain trust within movements. And I'm just wondering, in all of your years of research, what you've come across as far as advice for activists who are working day in, day out, trying to do this work um, effectively. Because we know that we're being surveilled. Um, and and I, as I go on in life, I want to learn the history, and it's very important. But I'm much more interested in learning how to deal with it. Um, so it, has there been any research about that or tips or anything? Yeah, I, I think that's a really hard thing to address because one of the COINTELPRO tactics that informants would do would be to accuse other non-informants of being informants. So lobbying and throwing around accusations of, of be, obviously have, have a corrosive impact. On the other hand, I mean, informants do exist. My suggestion would be if someone like approaches you and asks you to like engage in violence, like get as far away from that person as possible, because um, even if they're not an informant, they're not someone you want to be you want to be involved in. I would suggest if you think there was surveillance in your group, filing a, a FOIA slash Privacy Act request on yourself. And the other thing I would say about an example of very non-effective use of, in, of counter countering informants was that the Revolutionary Communist Party was very concerned about informants, so they only let certain information be in the leadership, and then the leadership was rife with informants, so the FBI knew more than the rank and file. So I think sometimes people try to create this sort of culture of secrecy, which is counterproductive. There's not been enough excuse me, not written enough written about this, and maybe we could talk a little bit afterward about some leads on this. Um, to follow up on what Chip said, address the behavior, not the label. If you're clear about what the principles are of your organizing, what your strategic objectives are, people who are working against that are disrupting the organizing and need to be either get with the program or be pushed out. Whether or not they work for the state is not really relevant and also almost impossible to determine and also often very gray because the person who's in your movement and is disruptive may also at one time have gotten some money to inform, maybe didn't even tell the FBI real stuff. You know, the informants make stuff up all the time to the FBI. They're not like all seeing and all knowing. Um, so it's focus on the behavior and not the label. I just add a quick thing. I, I'm not an organizer. I'm, I'm really just a journalist. We, we did a lot of reporting on informants at Standing Rock where it was a huge problem and it completely destroyed the communities that were being, they were, you know, as often is the case with movements, there were all kinds of different groups with different agendas, different um, languages and frameworks and ways they were going about things, but there was also, there was real infiltration by the FBI and then by these private security firms, and then there was also a lot of suspicion that completely destroyed relationships, sometimes based on absolutely nothing, just, you know, gossip or, or just totally unfounded suspicions. We had all these documents that we obtained through a leak, and I had people for months email us asking us, is this person an informant, is this person? And you know, we, like, of course, didn't engage with that, but also could see how it really devastated that project in many ways. Um, and again, I, I don't have an answer, but I think, you know, as a, as a journalist, I, I, I like nuance and, and kind of complex stories. And, and what I can recommend is a book, actually, um, called Bluff City, uh, that was published, I believe, last year, that talks about Memphis and talks about Ernest Withers. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar, but Ernest Withers was the civil rights photographer. He is, was this black photographer in Memphis that took a number of photos of you know, King through the years. He is the one that took the I am a man photos at the sanitation worker strike right before King was killed. He was you know, a Memphis figure through and through, was a civil rights photographer for like two decades, and was revealed a few years ago an FBI informant all along. And so when that was revealed, I think it was right after he died, actually. Um, 
you know, of course, there was like a lot of canceling this person and uh, this is it. Like, you know, you're just like a snitch and that's over. A and this book, I think, is really good because it just is, is complex and doesn't make excuses, doesn't condemn him, just kind of explains his story and how he came to this. And so it's, I just think it's a good read. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, this is going to probably sound silly, but I know a few organizers, when they were suspicious of certain people because of, again, the behavior, they just had them do a lot of busy work. Yeah. Like, you know, go make copies, um, run to Kinko's to find out this information for us and get them to do a lot of things that doesn't involve planning. But a lot of busy work, hand out flyers, you know, stay away from the office as much as... <laughs> possible but that was uh one of the things and then i had a question about um because i remember you were mentioning uh like alex well you didn't say alex jones but the info wars and stuff like that um i've heard this this thing called the office of leadership analysis and i don't know if that's a real thing or if that's just like a conspiracy theory thing now i i, I know that they have something called leadership analysis with the cia but they were referring to something in the U.S. where they go and they analyze so-called leaders of various movements like, you know, like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, just like in Cointelpro where they were talking about, uh, I think they were saying that the four, uh, in, at least in the black organizations, the four main threats were like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael and Elijah Muhammad, but then Elijah Muhammad and Stokely Carmichael were eliminated because one was too old, one was too young, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I, and I've Googled it, and the only thing I ever see is a CIA, you know, uh, Office of Leadership Analysis. But, you know, of course, they say CIA is not supposed to deal with domestic, but that doesn't mean they don't, of course, because they do whatever they want. But I was curious if you ever heard about it in, in context of, like, FBI or spying on organizations, because usually they try to find out who's um, the leadership secondary leadership sympathizers and whatnot, or if that's just something that was made up? I, I don't have an, an answer. Um, I've, I've not heard of that before. I think within like the Pro era, I think it seems likely they were looking for who the leaders were. Whether or not they had an official program with that name, I, I don't know. I mean, I know the CIA I haven't heard of it, but just one thing I'll say about Ferguson, and one of, some of the conversations I've had with, with activists that have been like, thinking about this a lot, is actually it appears that like, the two guys who were uh, ultimately called black identity extremists retroactively, they were not leaders in any way. They had just joined the protest. So like, it, we do have documents that show that the FBI was actually tracking some of the better known activists in Ferguson. But I think the people that tend to be more at risk, especially for entrapment, are people that are actually a little less connected and a little more naive and new to the movements and more marginal. Like the the funny thing though with Ferguson, quote unquote Ferguson, because Ferguson is really just eight blocks. So you got like Spanish Lake, Clayton is really right. the seat of power. I'm from St. Louis. Nice. My my niece, well not my niece, but my sister. So that's that's a totally different thing too. Because when they were talking about, if you ever watched the original video, a lot of the police that were there were not from Ferguson. Mm -hmm. They were from Spanish Lake. They were from Clayton. They were from. Whole bunch of other municipalities over there that, that came in through the police and all that. So Ferguson is really it's a tiny, block yeah. area. A lot of the activists that they were going after were from like uh, uh, organization of Black Struggle and some of these mm -hmm. other movies that actually are from St. Louis. So yeah, definitely. Hi, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. Um, I'm completely on board with you in acknowledging that the police have been a tool used by the ruling political class, usually to enforce the capitalist, racist, white supremacist uh, agenda. But I also, I'm wondering how you would respond to someone who said, as they've said to me, that crime is down now, um, 
you know, over the last 25 years, it's down to the, to the lowest points in history through all demographics, all socioeconomic classes. Um, and so, yes, some, there are some, I think, horrific policing, but it's, it's also leading to a safer community for, for people in the United States, how you would respond to that. And also how, how if you have any concrete example of a policing system, whether that be community or a national government that made changes to better have better transparency or better accountability around its like wh where have there been concrete steps where this has been improved that we can look to as examples because obviously there's huge issues but there are also real problems of crime you know and I I'm not a fan of the police, but I've also lived in many countries where there's zero rule of law, and I'm telling you that's not a great place to live either. So how do we kind of straddle that? Um, what would you say about that? So I don't, I'm not gonna try to answer all of that in part because I don't wanna, I wanna talk also more specifically about political policing, so we could, we could talk some afterwards, but I will just say very quickly that the crime drop did not start when they then, when they like magically created police forces who then started working. Like where were the police when there was 20 years of crime going up? There were police then, there were police now. The police wanna claim every one of the 20,000 individual police departments across the country wanna claim that whatever they were doing somehow miraculously was completely transformed 25 years ago and that everything about the crime drop is because of what the police force in Toledo was doing or what the police force, it turns out also in Toronto, in Amsterdam, in London, in parts of, this is an international phenomenon, the crime drop, and it cannot possibly have anything to do with what tens of thousands of individual police departments just woke up one day and all started doing something different. Because as a police scholar, I can tell you, they did not start doing anything different in the vast majority of these places. Judy's smiling here. You could talk to Judy afterwards, who knows the details even better than I do about this. Uh, police abolition is a longer conversation. Take a look at the book. Verso brought some copies of the book over there. Uh, we can talk more about no one's talking about tomorrow we flip a switch and there are no police and there's no rule of law. This is about a process of divesting our reliance on punitive and coercive mechanisms for solving our problems. Let's, got some over here. I had, I had, oh, I had two questions. One, what are disbursement centers? And second, um, do you all have advice for people involved in Palestinian solidarity work, like student activists, um, for, like, you know, I guess we should assume we're being surveilled. Um, like, what do we, what do we do with that knowledge? I, I mean, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, I, I, I would say assume you're being surveilled. There's a lot of, like, fixation on, like, high-tech surveillance so people are going to like signal and things like that but if the person you're signaling with is a confidential informant it's it's not very helpful so i would i would keep that in mind i i think the biggest thing though is to not have let this have a chilling effect on our speech like we should never not go out and protest for palestine or go out not go out and protest against the you know u.s aggression against iran because you know, we're, we're afraid. And I, I think sometimes when we talk about repression, we, we accidentally sort of facilitate this, this um, chilling mechanism. Um, I don't know if that's helpful information or not, but that's, that's my answer. We're at a moment where we should be organizing openly. Yes. We should not be buying pipe bombs. We oh, should yes, not yes. be planning violent extremists. I just don't see the political utility of that in this moment. Maybe in some other moment we can have that conversation, but my view is to be as open as possible. I assume, I mean, my views are incredibly public, and I just assume they're available, they're archived, whatever, but it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter. And in fact, the publicness of my profile I view as protection. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, the type of change, we need something from like mass movements. It's not going to come from like four people in, in a basement plotting something. So I, I think that understanding both the fact that the type of change we need is like mass organization, mass movements, and how in certain sense those things are sort of more insulating from police repression than um, pipe bombs. And if someone asks, once again, if someone asks you to do that, stay very far away from that person. Right, like you know, the Occupy Cleveland activist. I mean, the, the the informant asked them to blow up a civilian bridge on May Day. I mean, that's if someone asks you, get away from them. Right, you know, that's not your movement. That's not what we're about. Uh, I actually really like civilian infrastructure. <laughs> uh, I think we. Yeah, I was an Occupy Wall Street. I think we needed more bridges and like less bombs. Oh. I actually just have a fun thing. Like when we were looking at the Sun in Rock documents, we got this leak from this private security firm that was surveilling protesters and going to events very much like this one. And there's this one, there's one report that just cracked me up where this guy who comes from like a military background was calling, you know, protesters at Sandy Rock, jihadists and all these things. And he's, he goes to this thing and then he like gives this whole report to his superiors about intersectionality. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. This is what he went to and like listened to this whole conversation. And all he had to report back was like the definition of intersectionality. It's like, yeah. go ahead and like educate whoever's surveilling you and, and <laughs> you know, have those conversations. And if they're listening, well, all the better for them. So, so, you know. I had a right wing <laughs> infiltrator once asked to read my notes on capital volume one, primitive accumulation <laughs> of capital in, in, a, in a reading group. She's like, oh, can I see that private? Th-? I'm like, sure. And um, I hope she learned something. I, I, I hope she learned how state repression facilitated the transition to a system of private property. I think my outline was pretty clear. Property is theft. And that's this, Perdon. Well. Putting Perdon in here. So you can just pick whoever, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is mostly for Alice. Um, I am uh, recently became a contributor for Smithsonian Folklife magazine on indigenous issues, and um, I'm Native, and it is cool that they're letting me write about radical things, but, um, and I've written one article for them, but I'm working on one right now that's specifically about the suppression of Native resistance movements and dissent, and I'm running into some problems with the editors about wanting to talk about Cointelpro and wanting to talk about the topic of my article, which is the suppression of dissent. And I'm just wondering, you know, Smithsonian is not a radical publication. It's not The Intercept, obviously, but it's also, I have gotten away with writing a lot of stuff that I think, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe, like, no one would have been able to via them. And I'm just wondering what you think about, um, like, do you think it's futile to, like, try to get radical things published and, in in non-radical um, publications, and also, you know, I feel like by writing this for Smithsonian or writing publicly about especially Native dis- descent and the, its suppression, I run the risk of sounding like a conspiracy theorist because, like, <sighs> um, so I'm just wondering if you have any like tips on like how to infiltrate Smithsonian folklife. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. I don't know about that. I don't know if I have the tips, but no, it's not futile. It's, I mean, writing is never futile, right? And like trying to get these ideas everywhere. And um, yeah, I mean, always do it. Always try your best to do it. But I also think what, what's so fascinating about all this stuff is that this is history. If you're just like a history nerd like I am, this stuff is, just, and especially within, I mean, like, like the history of like surveillance of AIM activists is like, so you can just kind of go back into like a whole, you know, historical overview of how this has been happening. That's not radical in any way, that's just like the facts, right? And, and I think that's kind of like always a good way to, to get at this. And I think that we've been able to talk about black identity extremism through the Cointelpro thing because the Cointelpro narrative has been accepted by the mainstream for the most part. So now we're able to draw those, those connections to what's happening today. So by all means, do it. <laughs> and, and then, then my, I don't know how to convince them, but yeah. I'm just, my one point of advice, and I, I don't know if you did this or not, would be to as much as possible rely on government documents. I mean, like, the church committee report flat out says it's a covert action 
designed to, I would never say that without quoting the church community because people think I was a crank, right? And they probably already do, but um, in an audience like this, we, we get it, but like when, when talking to like, you know, non-left audiences, you say, and the FBI engaged in a domestic covert operation in order to uphold, people say that's crazy. But then you say, well, it's it's on page 56 of book three of the church committee, extra staff perspectives on domestic, it's not on page 56, but it is in book three, um, extra staff perspectives on. So like, like, like the stuff in the church committee report is inflammatory. Right? Like if, if any leftist wrote that or made those allegations, I think even other leftists would probably be like, I, I, I think I'd be like, hold on, buddy. This is, this is getting a little much. Um, so like and like in this report and like when I talk to like college classes or give presentations, I will sometimes on the screen like have like screenshot church committee page five mass detention program. I know this sounds Alex Jonesy, but here here here's what the U.S. Senate said. So I mean if there that's 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 I think in terms of legitimacy, I think we have to be very careful what sources we use, and I think people on the left, and this is, I, I don't know if, this is not you, but just, and I myself do this, like sometimes don't always use the best sources and we should be trying to go back to the government reports and to the primary source documents. Because you, you, can't, you can't argue against the church committee in 2020, it's non-starter. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, just because Judy, you have a question or a question here. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, and it goes back to the conversation about why are the police fascists and why are they like they are. They are. Um, and um, I think it's uh, structural, but not just mission, structural and also um, psychological. And uh, what I would say is the police is are the most totalitarian of all uh, of our institutions, more totalitarian than your average corporation even. And the people who work there, including those people that you talk about who sound like they're very nice and want to do, you know, um, are totalitarian mentality people from top to bottom. They may not like it, but they are and they're comfortable there. And <clears throat> the way to get a handle on that, I think, is two pieces of writing that were decades ago. One is Adorno on the uh, authoritarian uh, personality. The other is Wilhelm Reich on the same issue. It tells you everything you need to know. I use that language of authoritarianism rather than totalitarianism. We got time for one more over here, maybe? That was a quick one. My, I'm, mine is just a call to action. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure, mine's very, oh, sorry. mine's very simple. What are fusion centers? Okay, and then make your announcement. Okay, um, on January 31st, a lot of different abolitionist organizations in New York are organizing a citywide day of transit action in reaction to the ongoing crisis of the NYPD, um, polit uh, pol I don't, you know, having more police in the transit. Yeah, fair vision policing um, and all the different sides of NYPD presence in the MTA. Um, they're calling for lots of different affinity group type structures to organize their own actions. Um, centered around that, you can find the different points of unity and stuff on Decolonize This Place's website. Um, and I highly recommend that you try to find something to do and uh, link into that. Fully support that. So f fusion, maybe you can say. You take it, Alex. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me, let me again, uh, recommend Brendan McQuaid's book, which is about fusion centers. It's very good. F fusion centers are joint intelligence gathering operations that also enact real policing. So they w were primarily expanded after 9-11 to allow for different regions to collect intelligence from federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, from the media, from et cetera, and then to sh issue information briefings to police agencies, government agencies, corporations, et cetera. They, they don't all run exactly the same way. They're federally funded for the most part. And in Brendan's book, he says basically they've adopted predictive policing and are using it to police low-income communities. They're not chasing terrorists because there aren't any terrorists in Omaha, 
right? But there's a fusion center, so what do they do? They advise police on where they do crime mapping for them, and it's just an extension of high-tech policing, and it's a massive amount of federal resources going into it. And in addition to the fusion centers, there's a joint terrorism task force, right. which are something that I focus on a lot. And these are FBI-run terrorism task force. They're staffed also by local police. I think I, I'm not going to—I don't remember the number how many local police are in them, but a lot— um, and also sometimes other agencies. Yes. I was looking at someone who was visited by the FBI, and I found the guy's, the FBI agent's LinkedIn profile, and he was a Secret Service agent assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And they're a good point of targeting on the local level because not doing the rule of law argument, but in a lot of cases they sign memor- and memorandums of understanding with the FBI that they follow the FBI guidelines and that the local police, by doing so, are breaking the law. And in San Francisco, which pulled out, they found these FBI memos. They're like, yeah, there's no way the San Francisco police can be operating under the FBI guidelines without breaking the law of San Francisco. Um, And most states and cities have higher standards for their police than the (laughs) FBI has. And this goes back to those assessments, which are these investigations that don't require a factual predicate, just an authorized law enforcement purpose. And many states have it either in their constitution or in statute that you have to have like some very, very low threshold of, of pred- like extremely low, almost point of meaninglessness, but that like the FBI doesn't even give them that or the body cameras is another one. But so it's most likely your police are like, breaking the law by staffing the FBI. And it's literally the local police staffing the FBI. They're carrying out FBI investigations. The local the municipality is paying for them. They're still local police, but they're doing FBI work. And it's not good work. It's very bad. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to the People's Forum for having us, and Verso and The Intercept, and Defending Rights and Dissent for uh, sponsoring this. And where, I, where can they find your report well, online? It's They're it's all gone. It's at rightsanddissent.org slash FBI hyphen spying. Okay, very good. <laughs> FBI spying.